By the way, if you find the information we've just discussed particularly interesting, I recommend one or all of these three books by Mike Madrid. Um, the second two focused exclusively on the uh, Golden Age, but his first book, The Supergirl, is going uh, all the way up to the present. But for now, we are going to um, turn our attention beyond the Silver Age and more toward modernity, to use another grad school word. And we're going to start with discussing Gail Simone. Now, Gail Simone has been a pretty important writer of comics in the uh, 21st century, over about the last 20 years. She has worked on, among other things, uh, Birds of Prey, which uh, she did uh, actually the majority of the run of, of that. Batgirl, Wonder Woman. She was in charge of writing Wonder Woman's adventures. Red Sonja, which if you're not familiar with that character, it is uh, a, a female character from the Conan the Barbarian universe. And Deadpool. She didn't, she didn't create any of these characters, by the way, but she wrote for them. And her run as the writer on the Deadpool comic is, is very highly regarded by fans and critics alike. But that's not really what we're focusing on right now and why I bring her up first in this part of the discussion. The reason for that is that before before she she got her break as a writer, back in the 1990s, she was she was a fan. And in 1999, she wrote an essay and put up a, a website, part of a group that operated this website called Women in Refrigerators. Now. That is a callback to an incident that happened in Green Lantern number 54 in 1994, so five years before she wrote the essay. Uh, in, in that issue of Green Lantern, the uh, 1990s, this is a volume, uh, this is the third volume of Green Lantern comics featuring Kyle Rayner, neither of the two we've already talked about. But anyway, uh, the bad guy, Major Force, um, breaks into his house, and when Kyle Rayner comes home, he finds a note, and he has uh, Major Force has killed his girlfriend, brutally murdered his girlfriend, Alex, and folded her up and stuffed her in the refrigerator, which was, uh, you know, pretty well. The picture you see is as graphic as as they got. You can see just enough and see enough of his reaction to know what happened. Now, this was a full year before Kevin Spacey freaked out Morgan Freeman by sending Brad Pitt uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's head in a box in the movie Seven. So if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen the movie, oops, I just spoiled it. But hey, I gave you 25 years to watch it. Anyway, the whole concept behind um, Women in Refrigerators was, uh, was that, that that particular most um, kind of galling example of that type of violence against women in comics was part of an overall theme, an overall trend in the history, particularly of superhero comics, in which the female characters, this is what, uh, this is what she was, uh, this is what Simone was, was arguing, and she made a big splash with this. Uh, there were several media outlets that uh, wound up writing articles about it. But that basically female characters existed within the framework of superhero comics as plot devices, not as actual people, not as characters, not as characters that developed. 
Uh, in other words, in most cases, Simone was saying, the, uh, the female characters get brutally beaten or in some cases raped or murdered or depowered, that is, have their powers taken away. And it's not as a means of advancing their character's trajectory. It's as a means within the story to have the male hero react and suffer and perhaps grow as a character. So it's part of the male character's plot trajectory, character trajectory, not the woman's. Um, one example of that is way back in 1980 in the pages of the Avengers in which, well, it's kind of a convoluted story. Uh, there are several characters uh, in, in Marvel that are all sort of interconnected. Uh, Immortus, Kang the Conqueror, uh, Ramatut, they're all different versions of the same person who travels through time essentially. And in this one, Immortus captured Ms. Marvel, Carol Danvers, who would later be Captain Marvel, and sort of uh, sort of brainwashes her, hypnotizes her, and impregnates her with what ultimately is another version of himself that rapidly grows up. Um, and then uh, she leaves the Avengers to, to go off and, and live with uh, Amortis, basically, because she loves him. Uh, some people pointed out, some letter writers, fan letters pointed out, hey, you know what that is? That's, that's rape and trauma. Uh, and it's sort of Stockholm Syndrome, where uh, she has been... Uh, Against her free will, her mind has been controlled and altered, and yet it's being presented as, well, here's another thing that happened, right? And so um, Marvel went back and sort of undid that. They didn't leave her forever uh, with this, uh, this freaky situation, uh, and then she re-entered, but she had lost her powers. Um, that was another story. Um, and, well, it has become kind of uh, infamous as, as an example of a female character really just, you know, being abused, both abused as a woman and abused as a character. That is to say, I mean, this character was, uh, for all intents and purposes at the time this came out, that was the end of the story for Miss Marvel, and it wasn't a very satisfying ending, although it looked like it from the outside because she was kind of like a Stepford Wives kind of thing, if you're familiar with that. With that. Um, through the 1980s, there were several other examples. Um, you had a period where uh, on the right there, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, got really grumpy and started slapping... Uh, his wife around, the invisible girl, who finally became the invisible woman, by the way, in the mid-80s. And then on the left, there was this major plot line where Henry Pym, Henry Pym, the original Ant-Man, uh, who was now going by Yellow Jacket, had kind of a, kind of a mental breakdown because of his inferiority complex, because he was just a teeny tiny ant guy, basically. Um, and so he uh, had this breakdown and he started uh, doing kind of insidious things to, to set up uh, disasters for him to swoop in and, and rescue everybody uh, to make himself look more important. And then he also started um, beating his wife, Janet uh, Van Dyne Pym who was the Wasp. And, I mean, there were... Um, she, she came to work with, with unexplained bruises and stuff uh, there to the uh, Avengers mansion. And this ultimately led... This was part of a big trajectory where Henry Pym wound up being kicked out of the Avengers, and then he got framed by his archenemy, 
and got wound up going to prison and reached rock bottom and then you know found himself and came back and um uh his marriage was in a shambles in the comic book although they got back together kind of several times over the next decades but the point is um what role did the wasp serve in this well she served the role of standing there and getting slapped around so that we could witness the uh the character arc of her husband um and and follow follow that along plus beyond that just the fact that you've got images like this of of people uh, of domestic abuse and it's not necessarily well it was presented in a very bad light with henry pym um but it's also kind of presented in such a way that it's just like you know these are things these are the sort of things that just happen um and that's very problematic now simone and her allies made up on the website the website's still up you can google it women in refrigerators and find the original site they made a list of female characters in comics who had been treated this way in one way or another over the years up until 1999 well um another of the most infamous examples of this that really really ties it all up uh, so far as displaying all the bad parts of it. it came from a graphic novel by uh, written by Alan Moore from DC called The Killing Joke and it was about you know Batman fighting the Joker for the umpteenth million time but some significant things happen in this one that are different from previous uh, one of them is that the Joker goes to Commissioner Gordon's house and Commissioner Gordon's daughter, Barbara, is secretly Batgirl, right? Which I don't think the Joker knew in the story. Um, she answers the door, and as you can see, he, he shoots her in the crotch, which leaves her um, paralyzed. Now, that is... Uh, there's a lot of obviously symbolism in this imagery uh, the very fact of uh, how he shoots her and where he shoots her and the whole idea uh, the whole point is that he's going to traumatize Commissioner Gordon and capture him and then use him to try to traumatize Batman so Barbara Gordon a character that had been around at this point for about well for over 20 years as Batgirl well, that's it for her, for uh, uh, being Batgirl, because she's, she's paralyzed after this uh, from the waist down. And she does wind up, um, years later, uh, becoming uh, a, a superhero again in a different way in her wheelchair as Oracle, who was sort of the leader of the Birds of Prey. And... It was her mind that she was using, you know, her computer skills and everything. Eventually, um, if in, for, for reasons and in ways we will discuss later, all of DC continuity and canon gets all changed around and this kind of gets undone as though it never happened. Uh, but it's disturbing nevertheless. And, like I, like, like I said, this, this leads to her being not only attacked... Uh, Kind of symbolically raped and depowered uh, and her as a character it becomes you know um, powerless after that that's what depowered means I guess but um, how does you know in the long run it did lead to some character development for her but that was not envisioned at the time that came years later and that's the other thing is that when male characters have things like this happen to them they usually recover fairly quickly even if they lose their powers it's always a temporary almost always a temporary thing that can then highlight their personal struggle to come back you know and then they come back better than ever but a lot of times when it happens to female characters, 
that takes them out of the story completely. Or, as the case with uh, Batgirl, it is years and years before they get back to where they were. And all is a plot device. Uh, all is a plot device to further the, uh, the development of the male characters. Now, here's another example of that. Um, in Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was part of the 50th anniversary celebration of DC, by the way, it started 1985. It was a 12-issue miniseries, ran until 1986. And I mentioned it before as being maybe the most important big crossover event ever in comic books. Uh, and we'll talk about it more later. I don't want to give too much away about the, the plot and what happens, but I will tell you that two major characters, spoiler alert, two major characters get killed in this miniseries. Barry Allen, the Flash, gets killed off. And so does Supergirl who is Superman's cousin. So the, uh, the pose here that Superman is striking on the cover is kind of an iconic uh, image from comics history, uh, recreated by this, uh, by this fan at a convention. And the fact that he is recreating it with a blow-up sex doll has much deeper levels of meaning than perhaps he even realized when he was doing it, right? Because she's an object. She is a sexualized object who is just basically tossed aside. Now, big difference between the death of Supergirl and the death of the Flash. The Flash dies very heroically. Uh, sort of a lot of the plot turns on him and his sacrifice that he willingly makes, um, which saves the multiverse. Okay, so it's a really big deal. Now, part of the reason for this was so that uh, so that the Flash's former teen sidekick, Kid Flash, can take over as the Flash, and they can therefore keep that character as a younger person, right? Because uh, clearly he must have aged over the decades. That's part of it. Now, that's how he died off. Supergirl just kind of uh, randomly. Uh, gets struck down by the bad guy in the fight. Um, no bold, heroic, noble sacrifice, and the fate of the uh, galaxy doesn't turn on it. She just happens to get struck down, mainly, you know, so Superman can make his weepy face right there. And here is a, a actual, here's the, the scene where Supergirl uh, gets gets blasted by the bad guy. Gail Simone pointed out back in 1999 that if you continue killing and injuring the characters in comics that girls identify with, girls will stop reading comics. Now, I would also point out that the types of things that uh, we've just seen and the disturbing frequency and sort of, um, you know, flippant way that some of them have been, have been presented can contribute, obviously, or would contribute to a sense of disempowerment and irrelevance to female readers and a reinforcement of the idea that they hold a subordinate place in the narrative. So the only thing that's going to uh, really counteract that and, and improve the situation overall is more women writers, which fortunately in the years since we've seen. Speaking of women writers and artists and editors and so forth, what we're going to do now is take a closer look at uh, well, really just kind of a survey of some of the uh, some of the more prominent women who have worked in the comics industry since the dawn of the golden age. Now, here on on this page, we've got uh, some of the women that we already talked about who worked at uh, all of whom, in one capacity or another, worked at Timely during World War II. 
when there were more positions open for women due to the uh, due to the war. So I'm sure you remember these. Dorothy Rubicek, who was an editor at Timely and then later the first woman editor at DC, where she edited the Superman comics for many years. Pauline Loth, the uh, artist from Miss America, for whom I couldn't find a photograph. The artist Marcia Snyder, the writer Patricia Highsmith, who went on to write the the novels, the classic novels, Stranger on a Train and The Talented Mr. Ripley, and editor Elizabeth Hardwick, who went on to become a very uh, important literary critic. But let's look at some more now. Now here's one that we mentioned recently in context of her most famous creation, June Tarpe Mills. As a as an artist, she went by her middle name, Tarpe Mills, because it was sort of um, gender ambiguous. And she believed with justification, as many female writers and artists have done through the years, that if, uh, if the public didn't know she was a woman, they might be more likely to buy her stuff. By the way, there was a study that just came out uh, last year, I think, 2019, that shows that uh, in uh, the world of, of art still, when it comes to, like, to, to valuing paintings, that there's a subconscious bias in which art critics lower their estimate of a painting by a significant percentage if they know the painter's a woman. Anyway, um, Tarpe Mills started off uh, in her late teens as a model and later became a fashion illustrator, but by the early 1940s was working in comics. And in fact, she did work for Amazing Man Comics and The Masked Marvel. Before, in 1941, she created the comic strip Miss Fury, which, as we discussed earlier, also then became uh, a comic book. Uh, kind of a controversial figure. Miss Fury, uh, we have, not, not in this outfit, but uh, sometimes wore revealing outfits in her, well, revealing for 1941, um, not even noteworthy today, uh, in her secret identity. And there were a couple of occasions when newspapers, several newspapers, refused to run an edition of the strip because uh, Miss Fury, like, showed her shoulders or something. Anyway. Um, Mills retired from the comic book business in 1952, other than a brief comeback in the early 70s, working on uh, some romance comics. Also, we have Ruth Atkinson Ford, who was both a writer and an artist. She uh, did artwork for Miss America at Timely. She co-created Patsy Walker with Otto Bender, and she created Millie the Model. She wrote and drew for, for many years the adventures or misadventures of Millie the Model. Now, we've talked a lot about Patsy Walker and Millie the Model. So Ruth Atkinson Ford was the woman behind that. Fran Hopper got into the uh, comics business initially as Frances Dietrich, then uh, got married in the early 40s and changed her name to Fran Hopper. She did uh, Mista of the Moon, quite a, few, uh, quite a few issues of Camilla, and on both those you can see her signature in the lower left, despite the fact that the, uh, the character in question is credited to the uh, man who created each of them. She also did the uh, Gail Allen and her all-girl commando squad uh, comic for a while. She was out of the business by 1947 or 1948. Lily Renee Wilheim was uh, uh, brought up in a well-to-do Jewish family in Vienna, Austria, and when she was a teenager, her family fled Austria as it was being annexed by Hitler in 1938 
and made their way to the United States. She worked on uh, uh, Senorita Rio, Rio for uh, uh, quite a few issues. She managed to hold on uh, in the business until the mid-1950s. She did uh, Archie comics and she did several romance comics and she was the main main artist in the Abbott and Costello comic that ran until the mid 50s and then after that after that she wound up uh, writing plays and illustrating children's books. Nina Albright also got started in the business around 1941. She uh, she worked on Miss Victory, among other things, and she was out of the business by 1949. So, kind of the phenomenon we've already talked about, the fact that when all the male artists and writers started coming back from the war, these women who had been given the opportunity to create in the comics industry were squeezed out. Violet Barclay was an inker who came to work at Timely in, I think, 1941 or 42, at the beginning of the war, and remained at Timely until 1949. And there on the upper left, you can see an image of her from Stan Lee's book about uh, the comics in 1947, where he points out, he uses her as an example, that women artists also work in the comic magazine field. After she left Timely, she mostly worked on romance comics in the uh, 1950s. Then, uh, as, as the, there was another decline, you know, after the establishment of the Comics Code Authority, she finally left the business altogether. And I think she became a fashion illustrator. Marie Severin, we've mentioned her before, the sister of John Severin, Marie Severin, was one of the uh, one of the giants in the field uh, as a as a female illustrator, but just in general as well. She first came to work for EC Comics in 1949 uh, because her brother John was there and uh, needed a colorist, and she had uh, well she was an artist, so. Uh, she came over and started by uh, doing the colors on her brother John's work, but in a short period of time wound up doing being the colorist for EC Comics, the colorist, uh, essentially doing almost all of their stuff. There's a, there's a story, and, and it's kind of true, that some of the most gruesome panels in the horror tales um, were monochrome. She might make the whole panel yellow or light blue so that there's not a bunch of blood jumping out because she figured parents might freak out about that. Um, seems like she was, uh, she was a little prescient on, on that, that she foresaw that as a problem. After, um, after EC went under, she went to Atlas Comics, getting work... Uh, from, from Stan Lee as a colorist, but then 1957, you know, when, when Atlas, uh, at the direction of Martin Goodman, let practically everybody go. She's one of the ones that didn't get any more work from there. So she was uh, out of the, uh, the art business for a couple of years, but she came back to what was then, uh, what had by then become Marvel Comics in 1959, and was Marvel's head colorist all through the 1960s, and into the 1970s. And uh, in that time, in the 60s, uh, first she did some, some cover art, and uh, eventually uh, she was doing pencils, pencils and inks in addition to colors. She did Doctor Strange for a while in the 1960s. And by the 70s, she uh, had given up the uh, colorist position and was working full-time as a penciler, mostly at Marvel, although in the 90s she would be doing work for DC. Um, while she was at Marvel, she was the co-creator of Spider-Woman with writer Archie Goodwin in 1977. 
And when she, uh, when she passed away in 2018, as I mentioned before, she was the last surviving person who had uh, been on the creative team at EC Comics in the late 40s and early 50s. Ramona Freyden came to work for DC Comics in 1950, right out of art school. She did a few fill-in stories, and in 1951, got her, uh, her first regular assignment in Adventure Comics, where she uh, drew the Aquaman backup stories that appeared in there every month. In fact, she had that assignment for 10 years, from 1951 to 1961, uh, every month with the further adventures of Aquaman, making her the longest tenured artist to work with that character. So no one else uh, for a consecutive number of, uh, of issues has worked with Aquaman as much as she has. In fact, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the dawn of the Silver Age that there didn't have to be a lot of changes to Aquaman's appearance or secret identity or whatever uh, because he had never stopped being published. He just didn't have his own book. But there were some changes made to his backstory, some major changes to sort of uh, bring him into the Silver Age. And it was Ramona Freyden who drew those stories. She also created the DC superhero Metamorpho, who was a longtime, uh, longtime member of The Outsiders, she continued at DC through the uh, 1960s, took a few years off uh, to raise, uh, uh, raise some kids um, and focus her attention on, on that, and then came back in the 70s and uh, continued to work at DC. In fact, she did almost every issue of The Super Friends, which was a kid-oriented superhero title based on the TV cartoon in the... Uh, in the late 70s. She only had a couple of assignments at Marvel. Uh, she didn't like working at Marvel because their style was different. And we'll go into detail about this later. Um, at DC, it was more the traditional style. As the artist, you were given a detailed script written out panel by panel, everything that happens by the writer. Whereas at Marvel, you're just kind of given a synopsis and then you create all the uh, all the art and then the writer comes and fills in the dialogue and that's not the way she was used to doing things that does give a lot more um, creative uh, um, sort of um, agency creative agency to to the artist as opposed to being totally bound by what the writer says uh, anyway um, she took over the Brenda Starr comic strip in the newspapers in 1980 when the uh, creator retired and continued to draw that uh, daily strip for 15 years until she retired in 1995. 